All right, welcome. So in this video, I want to talk about languages that are not context free. So if we consider the class of the context free languages, um, there are some languages that exist outside of the class of context free languages. In particular, here's going to be our first example, the language L equal to zero to the n, one to the n, zero to the n. Okay, now remember, the language zero to the n, one to the n, was not regular, but was context free. And we spent some time showing a context free grammar for it and a push down automata for it. But when we add another block, a third block on, we end up getting something that's no longer context free, as long as we're trying to keep all three blocks as equal as we see in this language. So let's just think for a moment how this might work. Well, let's say we tried to build a PDA for it. Okay, we could start putting some symbols on the stack for the zeros um, and uh, then match them up with, say, the second block, the ones. Um, but then we would have nothing on the stack to make sure that the last block was still the same size. And also vice versa, we could maybe put it on with the zeros, skip over the ones and then do it for the last block, but then we would not have anything to know what the middle block is and so on. So at most, we can make sure two of these blocks are the same, but not three. Okay, so once again, uh, this has just been sort of a hand wavy argument that's been meant to uh, push your intuition in a direction. I haven't given you a proof yet that this is not a context free grant, a context free language. So to prove that it's not context free, we need to, of course, make something more formal than that. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use maybe not surprisingly another pumping lemma. Okay, well, maybe that is surprising. We've got two pumping lemmas. So the, the regular languages had a pumping lemma that said, hey, if you've got this regular language and it's sort of got enough strings in it, then you must have some part of the language that you're processing in a loop of some kind. And that allows us to pump that part of the language, that part of the string, as it were, up and continue to get uh, more strings in the language. Well, that same idea is going to be true in our uh, context free case, partly because we can still find loops in push down automatas that we can use to uh, pump something up. Now, the difference is we still have the stack in the push down automata. And so the thing that we can pump is going to get more, a little bit more complicated. Okay. So it turns out now there's going to be two parts of the string that we can pump. And these kind of correspond to the parts that we might be putting onto the stack and then popping off of the stack in some kind of looping structure. And in effect, we're hinting that there's two loops going on here, at least two loops going on here. There might be more. And those loops allow us to process what's on the stack by putting things on and off that uh, might pre create two parts of the string that we can now pump. Okay, so let's look at the formal statement of the pumping lemma here. I'm going to read it out completely first, and then we'll look at each of its individual parts. So here we have the pumping lemma. It says, okay, if L is a context-free language, just like we had before, if L was a regular language. So if L is a context-free language, then there exists some P, the pumping length, length, that's the same, such that if we have a string W in the language, okay, still the same, and it's longer than the pumping length, okay, everything here so far, then W can be divided into five pieces, okay, that's different, satisfying three conditions, and now we'll notice that first condition is about pumping again, okay, the second one is about something being bigger than zero, and the last one is about being less than P. Let's look at these in a little bit more detail. So the first bit here is saying that we can break our string now into five pieces before it was three. And the parts that we're looking at that are important to us, we can see in uh, this part of the equation here that uh, we're pumping V and Y. These are the pieces that we pump. So these are the parts that are important. And again, I mentioned this is related to when we might load or unload things onto the stack. Okay, so five parts now. Now we'll also notice that again, those parts that can be pumped are limited in their length. They have to be less than or equal to P. Um, that again, that's related to maybe how many states there might be in the machine. Okay, and then, um, there's another sort of important subtlety here is that u v x y, the v x y, this is no longer 
um, pinned to the beginning of this of the uh, string, this part that we pump could be in the middle of the string somewhere. And that means that it can move around, which gives us a little bit more of a degree of freedom when we're doing pumping lemma proofs that we have to deal with. Finally, the two pieces that we end up getting pumped uh, do have to have something in them. So, But you'll notice we'll put them together here. The V and the Y together must have something in them, meaning maybe one or the other could be empty. Um, but uh, together they must have something that we can pump. So now let's see if we can try and show that this language that I claimed was not context-free is indeed not by using the pumping lemma. Okay, so again, we're gonna use this uh, strategy that we've been using with, it's the same strategy as with the regular languages, which is a proof by contradiction, where we're gonna say, hey, if we can show this language does not have the property, then we know that it is not context-free. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to use a very similar proof structure to the regular languages case. So if you have been practicing your regular languages pumping lemma, you're going to notice some of these pieces are the same. So we're going to start out. It's a proof by contradiction, as we I just mentioned. So we're going to start by saying, let's assume it is context free so that the pumping lemma should hold. We're going to investigate that to see if it does hold. And if it doesn't, then that means our contra we've reached a contradiction and that our assumption must be false. That's our goal. Okay, so let's continue. So if the pumping lemma is going to hold, then any string longer than the pumping limit, pumping length, sorry, will have these properties that we'll investigate. Now, what that means is we need to pick a string, and I'm going to follow the same design pattern that we've done in the past. I'm going to look above here and see that I've got some ends uh, in my uh, statement, and I can replace those ends with P and therefore by design it's going to be longer longer than the pumping length so we know it will have the pumping properties that we're looking for. Okay so again now that we've picked our string we know that at least according to what the pumping lemma tells us we can split that string into five parts. Okay now remember we don't get to decide how it's split we're just saying there is some way it can be split this way. So if any way works, then we're in trouble. We need to show that any way you can split it, it's not gonna work. And we have these properties to help us uh, make our argument. So let's start with the first one. Again, I ordered them in the order of how I reason with them in this case. So this first bit says VXY is less than or equal to P. Now remember the U part it can be as long as you want. So whereas before, when we would say maybe the length of x, y is less than p in the regular language case, we would say y has to be in the first block. That was what we would use to say. Okay, y has to be in the first block. But now, because u can be as long as it wants, you could take up the whole first block. You could, you could be all the zeros. And then our v and our y could be in the one or in the ones. Okay, and in fact, the only thing that we have going for us is we know that the length of the middle part, v to y, has to be short enough, less than or equal to p. And here's the lucky bit. If v started on the very first one, then we know y could end at the most on the very last one. It could only be in one block. So there's one sense that this less than or equal to P says, hey, these can only be in one block, but nothing says it had to start on the first one. It could start maybe on the last one. And then Y could be, have some zeros. So we could have some, our V could have some of the ones, and maybe like six ones we'll say, and our zero has uh, six, or, or sorry, our Y has six, uh, zeros in it and then we could pump those up and we could keep these two blocks in in match in matching sizes but that first block would be left behind and that's the idea that we need to capture here is that because vxy can span at most two consecutive blocks that's going to give us some argument so our v and y could be these two it could be these two, but it cannot span from the first block all the way to the last block. Okay, now this rule still plays the same role as it did in earlier pumping lemma proofs. It's saying, okay, now that we know that those V and Y bits have to span at least at most two blocks, then we also are saying, but we also have something that we're pumping. So maybe if we're spanning those first two blocks, there's some element that we're pumping in there. It's not zero. And that leaves us with now our last bit. Well, what happens when we pump? And so I'm going to say, well, I, in this case, 
Often in these ones, it, I find it's helpful to pump down. At least that's the first thing that I try, and if it works, I'm happy. So I'm going to start by pumping down with i equals 0. That means taking out the b and the y. Okay. Now we've set up here that they span at most two consecutive blocks. So if we take out symbols, then those symbols will be missing from at most two of the three blocks. So I'm not going to say which two blocks because I don't know how you're going to split it up. But if it spanned the first two blocks, we might be missing symbols from the first block, first block or the second block. But then we won't be missing any from the third block. And that's the argument that I'm making here. So since we will be missing symbols from at most two of the blocks, but we won't be missing from the third one, this means that all three blocks will be of different sizes so our string must not be in the language so our property does not hold that actually concludes we can just do what i call the post amble and say well since the uh, pumping lemma did not hold um, this is a contradiction and therefore the language that we thought was context free must not be context free okay so this is our first example of a pumping lemma proof for context free languages Let's sort of look at it in maybe more of its in its completed form. Okay, I've pulled out some of the uh, uh, extra comments made along the way, um, but we picked our p our, our sorry our s to be zero to the p one to the p zero to the p. We notice that when we split it up, our pumpable parts v and y can only occur in at most two of the blocks. That means when we pump down, that's what we chose to do, we ended up with maybe one block or maybe two blocks that have fewer symbols in it than the third block. And that put them out of uh, equality. And that's enough to show that our string is not in our language. And so we conclude that uh, this particular language is not context free. Okay, this is just our first example. Uh, in our next video, we're going to do maybe a couple more examples of non-context-free languages and showing how we can um, make these kinds of arguments. So thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you in that next video.